Today, we are very happy to welcome Dr. Avindra Nath of the NIH from the United States for a discussion about MECFS and long COVID with Dr. Yamamura of the N NCNP in Japan. I am Mieko Shinohara, the president of the Japan ME Association. I am an MECFS patient since 1990. I would like to briefly introduce Dr. Nath and Dr. Yamamura. Dr. Nath is a physician and scientist who specializes in neuroimmunology. He is the clinical director and senior investigator of the section of infections of the nervous system of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, NINDS, at the National Institute of Health, NIH, in the US. He's the principal investigator of the NIH post-infectious MECFS study and two intramural NINDS long COVID studies, Natural History of Post-Coronavirus Disease 19 Convalescence, an observational study of neurological function after COVID-19 infection. Dr. Yamamura is a physician and scientist who specializes in neuroimmunology. He has been studying multiple sclerosis over 30 years. He's the director of the Department of Immunology and the director of Multiple Sclerosis Center at the National Institute of Neuroscience, NCNP in Japan. He began research on MECFS in 2015. He has recently published a research about discovery of immune biomarkers for MECFS based on B-cell receptor repertoire analysis. I would like to share the background of what is happening in Japan. Here in Japan, there was a long delay compared to the US for long COVID to be recognized as a medical condition. Also, MECFS has been almost completely excluded from the examination of long COVID. Government funding has excluded MECFS from long COVID research. While there is now more media coverage on long COVID, MECFS is rarely mentioned. We hope to learn today about what research is being conducted on MECFS and long COVID in the US and what progress has been made so far in Japan. So first, Dr. Na, we read your paper, which was published in Neurology in March last year. When did you start to see long COVID patients? Yeah, so, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. The, um, the pandemic started here in sometime in January in the United States. And we knew right at that time that because it was a respiratory infection and people were developing neurological symptoms, that likely we will see MECFS like manifestations in this patient population. So, uh, you know, I wrote the article in March. At that time, it wasn't entirely clear what we would see, but we predicted we were going to see these patients and that hold up true to be the case. So by the middle of the year, uh, we started seeing patients that we were convinced were overlapping with MECFS. So you have also spoken about the association between long COVID and MECFS in the Bloomberg TV in June last year. Do you see a lot of long COVID patients who meet the diagnostic criteria of MECFS? Yes, I think there's substantial overlap between the two diseases. They may not be complete overlap, but a lot of the symptoms are quite similar and, um, and the manifestations are quite similar. 
What we do not know is if their immunology is the same or not. And, uh, and certainly uh, long COVID is initiated by a virus and MECFS, there may could be multiple triggers for it. So there are some differences, but the overlap is quite significant. Do you have a sense what percent of people develop MECFS after COVID-19? Yeah. So um, the numbers come from uh, some large studies done uh, in the National Health Service in England. And they, because they have a National Health Service, they have really good health records. And so uh, the way they have determined is that somewhere between uh, 30% or so of individuals, and sometimes as in some studies as, as high as 50%, and after three months still have persistent symptoms, okay? And then there is a study from the Netherlands, and that shows that if you don't recover by about five to six months, then the symptoms persist for over a year. And again, the percentages they're talking about is between 20 to 30% of individuals. That's very high. So will you tell us why it is so important to study long COVID and how that could contribute to the research of MECFS? What age groups are these patients? Yeah, so the age group that is most affected, it can occur at almost any age, so that's not the case, but um, it's usually in their 40s, uh, 30s and 40s is when we're seeing the vast majority of the patients, and there are more women affected than men. So the type of patient population affected is one that is the most productive in society. So the socioeconomic consequences of this is, is huge. You know? In your research, did you start to see the mechanism of how MECFS develops after viral infection? Can you share any insights from what you have found so far? Yeah. So we're still in the process of analyzing our data. We collected a lot of data on patients that we brought in here. A sample size is small, but nonetheless, we studied them very extensively. So when COVID hit, um, at that time, we had not fully recruited our patients that we wanted to study, but we decided because we were not allowed to bring in any MECFS patients or any patients for that matter, uh, to NIH, we decided, okay, it's a good time for us to now start analyzing our data. So we we're still haven't finished analyzing the data, but it's very clear that there, there is immune dysfunction in these patients. Um, and um, we're trying to figure out what is the significance of that immune dysfunction, how it correlates with all the other parameters that we measured. And we found that there's also mitochondrial impairment uh, in the patient. So, and maybe they go hand in hand. Uh, so we are still in the process of trying to put it all together. In the U.S., about how much funding has the government provided to research long COVID? I hear many of many other researchers in the U.S. are doing the research on long COVID and MECFS. Do you or others plan to do a clinical trial to cure these patients? Yes, so the total amount of funding that Congress appropriated for this year for COVID is $1.3 billion with a B. So it's a huge amount of money and most of it will go towards long COVID related research. And, uh, and I think the benefits will be dear to MECFS in, in general. So there are huge um, uh, you know, cohorts being set up uh, for that purpose. And forget, what was the second part of your question? <laughs> uh, um, uh, oh, do you or others plan to do a clinical trial? Oh, to clinical trial. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so yes, there are huge plans to do clinical trials, both in MECFS as well as in long COVID. Um, and um, so the long COVID uh, will probably occur a lot sooner. Uh, but I think what we will learn from them would certainly be applicable to the MECFS population. So for example, at NIH itself, we're going to enroll patients with, in the process of putting together a protocol right now, it hasn't been approved yet. Uh, but our hope is to be able to do a placebo controlled study and just use either hydrose corticosteroids or IBI, which is immunoglobulins 
uh, and treat patients with it and see what happens. But we'll study a lot of immunology in that context, and then it'll allow us to uh, use more specific immune therapies in these patients. So that's what we're planning. And there are a lot of other groups around the country that are also thinking of various types of uh, treatment modalities that they want to use. I don't quite know all that information yet, but there's a lot of interest in clinical trials. Okay, thank you. So Dr. Yamamura, is there anything else you would like to ask Dr. Nal? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for coming. And uh, I, I have I, I had a chance to hear your lectures in the meetings, uh, Zoom meetings or something. And I always enjoyed your talk. And uh, yeah, I recognize you are a neurobiologist and uh, your specialty exp expertise is for bias. So I'm asking uh, about, uh, have you ever a chance to look at the uh, brain uh, tissues for detection of uh, COVID-19 virus? And uh, uh, I'm particularly interested in the mechanism of how the uh, taste and smell are dysfunction uh, mm -hmm. takes place in the patient. So this is the easiest matter to study, uh, I guess. But uh, do you have any uh, uh, results for this pathological or biological studies? using patient samples? Uh, very, very good questions, Dr. Yamura. And uh, I followed your work as well. You're doing some beautiful work and uh, uh, very high profile work as well. So um, it's a real pleasure to meet you and an opportunity to talk to you. So yes, you're right. Uh, my interest is in virology. And the first thing I wanted to do was to find the virus in the brain. So we got autopsy tissues. It was very hard to get autopsy tissues. People were not conducting them because of the risk of you know, cutting the skull and you can get um, big bone dust and if it's infectious, uh, you have to do it under very contained environments. So, but anyway, we managed to get uh, uh, several brains, uh, about 30 brains that we got uh, from the New York Medical Examiner's Office. And so the first thing we did was we said, let's look for the virus. And we couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we tried very hard. We tried everything. We tried uh, you know, immunostaining, we did, polymerase chain reaction, we did in situ hybridization, and we did RNA sequencing. And we looked at multiple different places in the brain. And we said, well, surely we should find it in the olfactory bulb, or we should find it someplace you know, in the brain stem. And uh, we did not find it. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's quite possible we missed it. And uh, there is at least one group in Germany that claims they did find some virus. But the, if there is virus, it's probably very, very small amounts. There's not overwhelming infection in the brain. I think we all agree on that. So then the question that you ask is an important one. If there's no virus, then how come people are losing their smell and how come they're developing all these neurological problems? And uh, so for the, for the smell part, if you look at the nasal mucosa, uh, and there are several papers published showing that there's copious amounts of virus in the nasal mucosa. So there's no doubt about that. In fact, an infected person when he is breathing is probably putting out trillions of copies of virus with every breath. Yeah? So the, and there are these sustenkular cells that are the support cells in the nasal mucosa that get infected, but the olfactory uh, nerve itself does not get infected with the virus. So that's why it's not traveling up the cribriform plate because people were quite concerned that the virus may actually go up the nose and into the brain and that's how it will spread. Uh, we think that the most of the effects in the brain are immune mediated. Yeah? So it is uh, all in your area of expertise. <laughs> yeah. And uh, when we looked at the blood vessels, you know, we found that the blood vessels are leaky in the brain. We found there were immune complexes deposited there. And we find a lot of macrophage infiltration in the prevascular regions. We didn't find any, a very few T cells at all. If this was a viral encephalitis, as you know, you would expect to see a lot of T cell infiltrates. We didn't find T cells, but we found macrophages. And I think the macrophages are there because the blood vessels are leaky and they're trying to you know, remove all the um, proteins that are leaking from the blood into the brain. And so most of the pathology is driven by the innate immune responses, I think, I see. within the brain. At the surface of the blood vessel, it could be all antibody mediated, I don't know. And uh, do you have, uh, are you aware of any reports about uh, autonomic dysfunction or 
autonomic nervous system pathology in the patients? Yes, so you hit upon a very important point, and that is in the long term, in the long COVID patients, we see a lot of autonomic dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And even if they don't report it, if you do autonomic testing, they're not normal. Ah, uh, and the patients will complain of tachycardia uh, quite often. And sometimes they complain of uh, decreased uh, blood pressure and dizziness. In fact, there was one neurologist that developed long COVID and uh, she was a uh, epileptologist. And I talked to her, she says the uh, dysautonomia was so bad that um, she couldn't even sit up, you know? mm -hmm. uh, And she had to lie down to talk. And so it, the dysautonomia can be very prominent. Okay, thank you so much for sharing uh, very valuable information. Thank you. So Dr. Yamamura, will you tell us what you found so far in Japan in your research? Uh, regarding MHCSF, yeah, we have been studying uh, over five years. And uh, uh, we are very much uh, interested in the immunological pathogenesis uh, because we are uh, basically immunologists and uh, have been working in the field of MS. And uh, we are very lucky to uh, know the uh, report by the uh, Dr. Carmen Schadenberg. Yeah, she developed an uh, assay to detect uh, anti-beta-2 or beta-1 adrenergic uh, receptor antibody. So we try to uh, uh, confirm her results and we had the same result. Okay, about 40% of the, our patients show the positive test for uh, autonomic autoantibodies. And uh, we know this test is ELISA. This is not very sensitive. So we are now going to develop the uh, cell-based assay system to detect, uh, uh, increase the chance of detection. So we very much look forward to having the data. But uh, we also uh, conducted the B cell receptor uh, repertoire analysis and uh, yeah, we already published uh, in uh, brain behavior immunity, but uh, maybe you are aware that we, our data is very supportive for uh, uh, this uh, antigen driven mechanism uh, for MECSF. And in that paper, we also studied the plasma blast uh, functional uh, biases and actually Type 1 interferon was overexpressed by the plasma blast from the patients uh, during the um, early uh, years of uh, MHCSF. So uh, taken together, uh, it's uh, very uh, worthwhile to uh, continue immunological study. And we are also interested in the treatment. Of course, the patients always are seeking treatment. And uh, in some patients, we have started to use corticosteroid or even uh, IVIG or a drugs used for rheumatoid arthritis. And some patients uh, seem to be very happy to uh, uh, have this. But it's of course not uh, uh, proven by clinical trial. So I, I very much look forward to uh, seeing what is taking place in the US conducting the clinical trials, yeah, IVIG or uh, steroids. Right, yeah. Well, you know, you've done really nice work. I'm very impressed by, um, by the work that you've published and I had an opportunity to look at your paper and, uh, and your findings are uh, very remarkable. Uh, and I think you're on the right track. Um, now, and the uh, B-cell abnormalities makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I think targeting those cells could be actually very good if it's done in a controlled study in the right population. So I think that's very encouraging. The antibodies to ACE2 is also quite fascinating because uh, some of the long COVID patients also have um, antibodies to ACE2. And uh, so it would be really good to see if uh, they are pathogenic significance and what they're doing. In fact, somebody told me that they could be anti-idiotypic antibodies because ah binds to the uh, ACE2 receptor and antibodies to spike protein can then generate antibodies against the antibodies and you actually end up with an 
anti-idiotopic antibodies. Yeah? And that could be mediating because that will explain why we can't find the virus, but yet there's all this immune complexes and pathology there. It could all be anti-idiotopic antibodies. Yeah? Yeah, very fascinating. Dr. Nas, is there anything you would like to ask Dr. Yamamura? Yeah, well, I would love to know what is your next plan to, uh, are you going to be studying the long COVID patients now and what kinds of immune studies would you plan to do or what would you suggest that we do? Uh, uh, I think your expertise could be very valuable to us also. Uh, yeah, uh, we are now conducting the, yeah, even the phenotyping, uh, yeah, as, as other people are doing. And we are also uh, analyzing gut microbiota and all, all, almost <laughs> we, we are about to publish the paper uh, about uh, diff, uh, gut microbiome uh, alterations in the patient. So it's very interesting. And uh, we are now planning to conduct clinical trial uh, like uh, you are doing, but uh, uh, see, <laughs> it's uh, uh, under preparation and I cannot tell you, but it's uh, something targeting B cells. That's what yeah, I would. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And from multiple sclerosis, I mean, you know better than anybody, targeting B cells has been very rewarding. They yes. And then if you target B cells, it also has an effect on T cells. So mm -hmm. uh, that makes a lot of sense. It's certainly worth a try. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. Well, Dr. Yamamura already mentioned about the recent uh, paper he published skewing of the B cell receptor receptor repertoire in MECFS in brain behavior immunity. Oh, you, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, just a moment, you, you already explained it. Yeah. Dr. Nath, do you think this could be one of the biomarkers of MECFS? I think it's a very important finding. Uh, it certainly suggests that, you know, it's being driven by some kind of antigen. Uh, just as he mentioned, because uh, you know you have a very specific population of B cells uh, that is activated, and uh, the observation suggests that there's a unique repertoire of the um, of the B cell receptor that is being uh, identified. So I don't know, uh, Dr. Yangmura, is it possible to identify the antigen using that method, or there may be multiple antigens? Uh, and if that is, that could be quite fascinating as well. To monitor in these patients. Um, yeah, this is very difficult to identify the target antigen. Yeah, as you know, but to, uh, after identify the target antigen, uh, our <laughs> paper will be uh, more uh, useful and uh, uh, spreading. Yeah, that's true. And also, the practical value of the assay is still uh, not uh, not very much. So we have to. Uh, uh, reduce the cost of the tests, and we have to uh, uh, customize uh, this. So it's uh, on the way <laughs> going to the biomarker analysis. But biomarker is not only useful for diagnosis, but also for the monitoring the disease activity. Yeah. So this activity monitoring uh, is uh, possible by using uh, BC biomarkers or exosomal microRNA or something like that. So we are, we are very much uh, positive for our results and uh, uh, in the near future, somebody will uh, use this biomarker for a surrogate marker uh, of, of in clinical trials. Uh, I, think. I think that's a step in the right direction. You know? It's a uh, very important observation. Yeah, I guess please. Is there anything else you would like to share or discuss together? Okay, from my point of view, uh, Japan is a, a very unique country, <laughs> geographically unique and uh, culturally unique, and uh, yeah, and we we are developing uh, high tech, um, high technology in medicine, but in some points we are uh, isolated. And in case of, for example, in the multiple sclerosis, uh, we have a much lower number of patients in Japan. So uh, our MS research was uh, left behind in the 
uh, in the 20th century, but now we are catching up and uh, <laughs> we can do the same level of research and treatment. Very modest. Uh, yeah. You've been doing cutting edge research for a long time. I have a particular affection for Japan. You know, I visited Japan uh -huh. the first time uh, when I was three years old. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, in, in case of MS, MECSF, we are still have to, to learn, learn from the United States and uh, we, we wish to be um, uh, the part of the global uh, studies for MECSF. Please uh, <laughs> let us join. <laughs> We would love to involve you more closely in our uh, meetings and everything, but the reality is we've learned a lot from you and from all the Japanese scientists over the years. You do really good cutting edge research. And I've visited Japan several times oh. uh, in the years and I've been to Sapporo, to Yakumama, to uh, Tokyo, and several places actually. Ah, oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. In fact, my grandson, uh, mm -hmm is now one month old is one quarter Japanese. <laughs> so I have so, no more reasons to take him to Japan. See, uh, <laughs> okay, please uh, come and uh, visit my laboratory. Yeah, in the next time. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise, we'd like for you to come and visit us too. Hopefully one of these days we can fly and meet in person. You know, that would be better. <laughs> yeah, oh, that would be great. <laughs> So thank you very much to both of you today. We are so grateful for your great contribution towards the neuroimmunological disease. We hope one day you can find a cure for us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. For thank you so much. Yeah.